We have chicken eggs. Both sides of your brain. <laughs> Barn glitter. Wool sheep. Hey guys, welcome back to Sage and Stone Homestead. My name is Heather, but I wanted to talk a little bit in this video about, about homesteading, about the kind of monotonous type things that homesteaders do on a daily basis and why I think this is a very great lifestyle for people with anxiety. So I pretty recently really started to understand that I have decent anxiety. Um, it stems for, from a couple different things. One of my main triggers is severe weather. As some of you probably know, we had a tornado relatively close to our house, but it was very destructive. Our house and homestead were fine. Uh, we were not directly affected, but we do have friends and community members in the local area that were very severely affected. Some of you may understand, some of you may not, but usually when there is something traumatic that happens in your life or indirectly happens around you, a lot of times it takes a few days for like the reality to set in. You're kind of running off of adrenaline in the first hours, days, maybe even weeks past a certain event and then it's, it's a lot. It can be a lot. And I have caught quite a bit of hate in the past when events that are near to me that don't directly affect me and my family, when those things cause me stress and I talk about it. Um, I don't know what to tell these people. Um, yes, I'm very grateful that we were not directly affected. Yes, I um, understand that other people have absolutely had it worse. The anxiety comes from seeing those people go through that and my brain just putting myself in their shoes and what I'm dealing with, which feels like a lot to me, I know pales in comparison to what those people are dealing with and it's kind of that notion that sends me a little bit into a spiral. I am very grateful that we were not affected by this tornado, but it doesn't change the fact that weather anxiety is a very real thing in my life. I wish that it was unfounded. <laughs> I wish that I could just be nervous for nothing and it's really unfortunate that my anxieties come true sometimes. Like the thing that I'm scared about actually happens. And so it doesn't it doesn't really help, but it's a fact of life. And there's a lot of things in homesteading that are very helpful when it comes to settling out anxiety. So the, for the past long time. Um, my daughter Addison has collected eggs and they've just sort of been piling up. This isn't really normal um, for me. I like to put them away. I like to kind of organize them, but I haven't done that. I haven't had the energy for it. I'm going to explain what I've recently learned about doing small little monotonous tasks like this and how good they are for your mental health. So inside this basket, we have a few different varieties of eggs. You can see we've got quail eggs, we have chicken eggs, and then tucked in here every so often are some duck eggs. So when I pack up the eggs, I have, this is for chicken eggs. We've had these laying around for forever. We like to reuse old egg cartons. I have this for duck eggs. It is dirty, so are the eggs. I do not wash them, so I'm not really worried about this at all. And then I have these cute little egg cartons that we also reuse. These are for quail eggs. Lately my quail eggs haven't been fitting in there super well. These are Jumbo Coturnix quail eggs. So we'll just have to see how well it goes today. <laughs> so I've just been going along happily sorting the eggs and I realized as I'm getting further down here, there's a bad egg in here. There's a bad egg in here. I can smell it. So some of them, it's not that one. Some of them do as they, you know, kind of collect in the basket, get a few cracks in them. And this is what's going to make them go bad. This egg actually does not smell bad, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna risk it, but I need to, I need to smell all of these now as they come up. And if it's quail egg, Sometimes those are a little harder for me. This one here is a double yolk or quail egg. It's not gonna fit in my egg carton for sure. These eggs are only at maximum like a week old. 
And so the rotten egg that is in here is very newly rotten, so it's not gonna be a case where you touch it and it explodes. That does happen, but that usually takes several weeks to get to that point. So I'm pretty sure I found it. This is a quail egg that has a really big hole in it and it's essentially empty. I'm gonna guess that possibly the fruit flies found this before I did, but this might be our stinker, which is, oh, this one's got a hole in it too. So yeah, I think that was it because I don't smell it anymore. So here we have 12 quail eggs, a dozen quail eggs in these little containers that I have. And this one is actually shedding. I didn't expect it to be able to. So as I mentioned, I am not going to be washing these eggs. Somehow the duck eggs end up dirtier than the other eggs. We have had quite a bit of rain. There is plenty of nesting material in the nesting boxes, but they choose sometimes to lay on the floor of our coop, which has bedding material down anyways, but you know, dirty feet happen when it's super rainy outside. And the reason that I don't want to wash these eggs is when I wash them, the more than just this like outside little bit of a muck does come off. There is a protective coating on the outside of the egg. It's called the bloom and it protects the egg, which is porous from outside bacteria from entering the egg. And if I wash the bloom off, I kind of just leave the egg open to being permeated by something nasty, which is why you find grocery store eggs here in the US are in the refrigerator, because those are washed. Oftentimes those eggs are also pasteurized, which I don't know if I understand how that process works. Maybe it's like with a UV light or something. It's obviously not with heat or else you'd be buying cooked eggs in the carton, which obviously isn't the case. Even though they're dirty, they'll be fine sitting out on the counter for quite a few weeks. We've had them last quite a few months on the counter. Obviously it's ideal if they're not ridiculously dirty. So sometimes I will just use those first because they can be the first ones to go bad. We don't sell our eggs. Sometimes we will give eggs to family or friends that ask for them if we have a surplus. And when we do that, we do pick through them and give them the cleanest ones possible. But stuff like this doesn't bother us. So as far as monotonous little tasks like this and their benefits towards mental health, I actually first heard Jess talk about it from Roots and Refuge Farm. She is such a valuable human being. She's a big part of what has encouraged me to talk to you about stuff like this, even though it's hard, even though it's sensitive. Um, the, the idea that it could also help encourage somebody else is, is why I'm doing it. That's why I do all of this. So when you've got stress or anxiety, there's fight or flight response and there's also freeze and collapse. This is sort of where I end up. Um, I don't necessarily have a flight or flight response, but I will kind of come internal and not do a whole lot. Um, I will do the basics that I need to, but it's really hard for me when I'm in a higher anxiety type point to get the motivation to do the you know everyday tasks that I have to do every day. I mean, We've got a whole farm. There's stuff that needs to be done. And I do do them, but sometimes it takes me a really long time to actually, you know, peel myself out of my stupor and get outside and do it. So lately I have been, oh, there's another, there's another cracked egg in here. Lately I have been starting my mornings by waking up and pulling out my crochet. Um, crochet is one of those monotonous tasks that does work your brain but it doesn't ask a lot of you and there's something about moving your hands that activates both sides of your brain that helps level things out so I actually looked this up earlier so that I could describe it better to you in a way that's going to be easier to understand than what I can come up with in my head. 
Rhythmic movement such as running, dancing, or drumming helps integrate your mind and body to reset the nervous system and bring you back to a state of calm. Activities should be easily accessible, relevant to your abilities, and full of simple, repetitive, familiar, and gentle movements. These kinds of activities can be even more powerful if they also involve bilateral stimulation, so both sides of your brain, which gets the left and right hemispheres of the brain coordinating with one another again. So when you go into fight, flight, freeze, or collapse modes, rhythmic and bilateral movements help the brain to redirect the resources that had rushed to the amygdala for survival back to the higher functioning parts of the brain. You can also be soothed by knitting, playing a musical instrument, swimming, or gardening. Can confirm. I have dealt with some level of anxiety, probably for my whole life, but I've been aware of it the last six or so years. We bought this farm in 2019 and I've said it before and I, I've never been able to fully quantify why until recently, but I felt like I fully came into myself when we moved here. I actually didn't even realize that I felt a little bit aloft and a little bit out of place until I didn't feel that way, until we had this farm. And I had all of these tasks to do all of the stuff like this and sometimes I think that that's why this season can be hard the season where we don't have a garden because there's a lot of repetition and small tasks like planting seeds and weeding and putting away the harvest but usually in the winter tasks like that that work your hands and your mind just enough to help bring you back down to baseline. They can be a little bit hard to come by and that's when the knitting needles come out for me. So I learned how to knit when I was eight years old. My grandmother taught me. She taught me both to knit and to crochet, but I learned knitting first and I look forward to this season a lot. But I know it's a little bit of a short season for me to be able to sit down and knit and crochet and so I've been trying to take advantage of that. Oh yeah, so here's the eggs that we got. Isn't this cool? This is one of the main things that I've been working on. This is actually crochet, and this pattern is made by the yarn itself. It's kind of hard to describe. I'm going to be linking a video at the end of this one that explains how this works. I can't remember the name of the channel, but the lady explains it really well. I call it crochet calculus because there is a little bit of math involved, but once you figure out the number of stitches that you need for each color in the skein and you work it across, the colors just fall into place like this. It's called planned pooling. It looks like it would be really difficult, but once you figure it out, it's really not like super technically complicated. That's one project <laughs> I've been working on. And this is actually the first thing that I made this season. I've worn this, I think in one video, it really hasn't been cold enough to wear hats yet. Our coldest weather comes in about January and February. But this is a knitted hat that I made using yarn that one of my friends actually spun herself. So this is wool hand spun. It is very lovely. And because this yarn is so special to me, I wanted to use it to make something that I would actively use all the time. So I could, so I could touch it frequently. So I have a little bit of a yarn haul that I wanted to share with you guys. If you are familiar with Sandy Brock from Sheepishly Me, I bought some of the yarn from her sheep. So we're going to open that in a second. But my friend that, my friend Nora, that sent me this yarn. I sent her a picture of the hat and she she loved it and wanted to send me another ball of her hand spun yarn. This is also wool. It's not actually the same colorway as this, but it's very, very close. And so I've got to figure out what I'm going to make from this. But isn't this lovely? Look at that. This is so precious to me. This one is the Sheepishly Me yarn. We will go over this one last. We'll save the best for last. But there's a pattern that I want to do that is supposedly viral, the viral strawberry pattern. Some of you who are crafters may have seen it. And I saw it and I said, oh, I need to do that. I need to do it, but in a blackberry pattern. 
so I bought this yarn. This is a super wash wool yarn. Super wash just means you are able to wash it and the structure of the yarn itself isn't going to mat together. That can happen with wool. That's not super wash wool. It gets, I don't even know how to describe it. It just gets bunged up. It gets, it turns into a mat instead of fiber like this. Let's see, here's the purple. Gorgeous. This is actually hand dyed up in Vermont. And then here's the green. So once I finish that planned pooling blanket, this is next on my docket for crochet. So if you're interested in where I purchased this particular wool, I bought it off of Etsy, but it's from Black Sheep Dye Works. You have no idea how hard it's been not to open these packages. I wanted to go over them on camera with you. This is from Sheepishly Me. Those exact sheep that we see on YouTube are right here in this bag. Their wool is, some of them. I also bought quite a lot, but what happened was I have purchased yarn from Sandy in the past um, and had a hard time getting everything that I wanted because her yarn sells out really fast. So I was super ready for this yarn drop and I usually will put more, more yarn in my cart than I need because inevitably some of it falls out of the cart as people like check out faster than me. No one checked out faster than me this time though and I got everything that I put in my cart. So this is more than I had really wanted, but that's okay. I will use it. This all is completely Canada made. So the sheep are raised in Canada and then the wool is spun in Canada at this little yarn shop called Mariposa. And this is just the regular standard classic natural wool color. I just noticed that there's, there's little bits of barn glitter, AKA straw in here. That's actually really special. <laughs> it's literally pieces of her barn. That is so neat to me. And then this is what I really, really wanted. So if you know much about wool, you know that black wool is actually not necessarily preferred because you can't you can't dye it. It's it's limited. But this black wool is not dyed. This is wool from some of Sandy's black sheep. She said that it took two years to build up enough of a stash of wool in order to make it worth spinning in order to get this yarn. And so this yarn was two years in the making and it is genuine black wool from black wool sheep. Oh, this is so special. This one is actually, the black wool is softer. That's weird, this is much softer. There's a lot more barn glitter in the black one too. It is a little bit brown looking. Um, it might look less brown on camera. It looks a little bit more brown in person. This is normal. Um, as the sheep grow and walk around in the sunlight, the ends of their fiber does tend to bleach out a little bit. So getting a little bit of a brown tinge to the black wool is quite normal. And then there's this. So these are dyed, but I love them. So Sandy has a few sheep called the Golden Girls. It's, you know, they're in her retirement village and they all have a beautiful different color. So she made this Golden Girls collection that started out like this, but it's dyed as a nod to her beautiful Golden Girls. The different colors. Isn't that gorgeous? I have, I have zero clue what I'm making with this yarn. No clue at all. So if you've got ideas, let me know. <laughs> it's really, really cool to me to understand kind of more scientifically at this point why I enjoy doing some of the things that I enjoy doing and what it really does to benefit brain health and mental health. It's very validating, to be honest. So even if you don't have a farm that kind of forces you into monotonous tasks like packing up bajillions of quail eggs, picking up some kind of hobby that works both sides of your brain, that gets your hands moving a little bit and gets your brain moving a little bit, but you can kind of do it in a way where your brain isn't completely turned on. This is kind of hard to describe, but I hope you know what I mean. That can be a good skill, a good thing to learn and to get into. So I am going to link some resources on knitting and crocheting in the description box below, because you can really do that no matter where you're at. And I'll see you guys again soon.